Hello and welcome on the Watches TV for this new edition of Primetime Watchmaking in the News. And since our last edition, well, I just wanted to update you on a few things from some uh, very recent product launches, Ulbricht AP, Richard Mille, uh, Breguet and more. And I also come back on the situation regarding uh, watch shows for 2021. Yes, this soap opera continues and is getting better every day in the direction of back to worse. And a few other important business matters for the industry in this troubled context, but I also wanted to tease you a bit with some very cool video reports coming to you shortly. Listen to this program. We'll take you along for another walkthrough video, and this time we'll be heading to the Valley de Joux, as we had the great opportunity of visiting the brand new and absolutely stunning Audemars Piguet Museum in company of its director, Sébastien Vivas, and Michael Friedman, head of company applications. And I can only say that this is really an exquisite place, one totally worth visiting. And I know that the current situation doesn't make things easy uh, for you to do so, but at least it will give you a great look into a new benchmark when it comes to watchmaking related museum. We also finally have a new episode in our Don't Do This At Home series with our good friend Peter Speak. And this time we'll deconstruct something pretty original here at the Watches Club with the Vintage World Traveler Pocket Watch from Vacheron Constantin. Super interesting, always a joy to make these. And last little element of teasing, well, 2020 marks the 20th anniversary of the chronometre à résonance from François-Paul Journe, a real watch icon. And guess what? Well, we'll have the man himself telling us all about it, quite special, and we, meaning, I mean, you and us, are very privileged to get this. So as you can see, some pretty cool stuff coming your way, but of course, we have more. And before diving into today's program, well, just wanted to say a huge thanks uh, for all your recent comments and interaction, and naturally, a massive thanks to those supporting us on uh, Patreon. This is uh, very special to us, and you are all very welcome to join for some extra little goodies, uh, such as merchandise. But I'm also extremely happy to announce that this month we will introduce a special live session where you will be able to ask us whatever comes to your mind. A bit of serious live interaction, pretty cool, can't wait. And of course, uh, if you want to join, uh, link in the description box uh, here and somewhere also around here. Viva our patrons! So let's start talking about uh, some new watches just released or some that we didn't uh, cover previously but are nonetheless uh, interesting in my opinion. So let's talk over with the new UR220. Actually, this is more like a revamp of the 210, one of my top favorite watches of all time. And you know what? Well, it's the watch I am wearing today. Hallelujah! What I particularly like with this uh, new version is that it now sits perfectly on my wrist, thanks to this uh, slightly curved shape of uh, the back case. I know I'm being uh, very objective right now, but I simply love this watch, which has all the over key ingredients that I like and even more. So naturally, you do find the signature satellite system uh, and the hour marker is kind of trapped inside the bottom trailing minute indicator and this one is actually a retrograde hand. When it reaches the 59 minute mark and 59 seconds, well this minute hand just flips in a flash back to the zero zero position on the other side overlapping the new indicated hour. So one of the main novelty with this uh, UR220 can be seen in the upper corners with a split power reserve indicator system for this hand-worn timepiece with 48 hours of power reserve. On the right side you have an indicator for the first 24 hours and then it, uh, it's taken over by the second indicator on the left side. Seems simple but actually it's quite a difficult technical feat achieved by Uwerk. The other new take of this watch is of course the case, which is not only curved like I mentioned, but it's also thinner compared to the 210 and this balances out the watch uh, much better, especially for me uh, with my quite small wrist. But uh, for the first time, I mean, they've used carbon, actually multiple layers of carbon, 81 in total, and ultimately it makes this watch very light and this is uh, further accentuated uh, with this uh, special rubber strap uh, material called Vulcarboné. Uh, with a very nice feel to it, I have to say. Okay, on the back side you have a pretty cool feature with some kind of next service indicator. When you get the watch, this indicator is set to zero and then you have a pin that you pull like on a grenade, but the fuse is much safer as you have 39 months uh, till you will have to resend it to OREC for some servicing, oil change and so forth. So obviously this feature will operate only as the watch is running, so were you to wear it only once in a while, well that can happen, don't know why, but it can. Well, uh, you will indeed have much longer than the 39 calendar month. Actually, I mean, if you look at this from the other angle, well, this indicator will actually tell you how much you are wearing your Eurek. Anyhow, it's a cool feature and all in all, well, I really like this uh, 220. 
and I can remove the 210 from my wish list and move on to this one. Even though, I mean, it's uh, quite uh, pricey and therefore might remain on the wish list for a while, unfortunately, just as unfortunately as handing it back to Overk in a few hours. All right, next watch. Uh, and I would actually use the plural as Audemars Piguet have just been uh, quite busy recently and have introduced a few novelties uh, totally worth mentioning. The first one came out a few weeks ago. It's an evolution of their flying tourbillon Royal Oak concept watch. And though they say it's a feminine version, well, I wouldn't be too surprised to see this on a dude's wrist. I really find this optical illusion drawing your eye on the flying tourbillon really well designed with these uh, different shades of blue. It gives it uh, really a nice depth and I also like that it has been uh, mimicked on the movement side with these uh, parallel bridges. It comes in either a white or rose gold uh, frosted case with a diameter of 38.5 mm but with a mix of satin and polished finish, really nice, super cool watch. Still in the Royal Oak uh, concept family of watches, uh, AP also introduced this flying tourbillon GMT version, definitely more masculine and coming in either shades of blue or grey. The 44mm case is made out of sunblasted titanium and the GMT indication can be seen at 3 o'clock uh, with this uh, trailing disc and uh, flipped around the back is quite impressive too with this uh, multifaceted uh, base plate, quite edgy for sure. And you can merely guess the two barrels offering this watch almost 10 days of power reserve. And for info, both models are limited to 30 pieces. So the next one goes a bit further when it comes to the world of complication with what is widely accepted as the holy grail of complication with the presentation of the Grand Sonnerie Carillon in the Code 1159 collection and using their Super Sonnerie development uh, augmenting sound volume quite significantly and first introduced in 2015. Well, there aren't many brands or even watchmakers capable of developing a Grand Sonnerie and what I quite like with this one is that when you look at it, well, there is not much uh, bragging about it. It's modern, different and subtle. Not one of these uh, in your face considering the super complexity of uh, such a mechanism. So instead you have this very original looking dial, but of course this is no ordinary dial. It has been designed and crafted by superstar enameler Anita Porsche and there are three variants but as a privileged customer you will be able to ask uh, for some personalization for the last two remaining timepieces as only five will be made. And as a quick reminder, a grand sonnerie means that this uh, timepiece will automatically chime uh, the quarters and the passage of the hour but you can also set it uh, in petite sonnerie mode and only the hours will be heard and naturally you can also use it as a minute repeater and listen to the ongoing hour and minute on demand. And of course, I mean, you can also set it on silent mode, uh, could be useful depending on the occasion. And I also wanted to mention that uh, this was, this is a carillon and this means that instead of having two gongs, something usual for chiming watches, well here you have uh, three gongs and this changes how you can combine the notes to express the time. So quite a remarkable technical achievement by the team of AP when you consider that this timepiece's movement is encased in a normal 41 mm size case. And just to be clear, it's not a totally new development. Uh, the base existed before, but has been seriously tweaked in order of adding this uh, Grand Sonnerie feature. Okay, to be honest with you, I haven't seen any of these watches in real, can't wait to do so. And we'll share some sequences of uh, the special encounters with our good patrons soon. All right, next timepiece with the Breguet Classique, le double tourbillon 5345, Quai de l'Horloge. It's sadly been a little while we didn't talk about Breguet, but I really think that this time they've come up with uh, quite a spectacular watch, uh, but quite opposite to what uh, we just discussed about being uh, low key. Since here, I mean, the show is totally more in your face and even more so accentuated uh, with this modern looking and pretty massive uh, glass box sapphire opening the dial even more and letting you observe this double tourbillon mechanism with the originality of having both of these tourbillons set on the hour hand, but actually there's a little trick as it's the entire movement which moves around in 12 hours. The hand or pointer, one could say, is fixed, pretty cool and clever, and the tourbillons are connected by a central differential system, average their running. So this watch's movement is not totally new either. We had seen previous versions some years ago, but it's its execution which comes with a serious revamp. It's now open work and really does justice to its uh, spectacular mechanics and nice finishing. You will find a guilloché feature, hand engraved parts, especially on the backside. Well, quite a demonstration. 
and it won't be limited, but as you can imagine, only a few pieces will uh, come out of Breguet's workshop. Richard Mille introduced their first developed in-house flyback chronograph, the RM72-01. We'll get this uh, in a second, but they've also introduced the fourth iteration of the famous RM27 Nadal tourbillon watch, marking already 10 years of a very fruitful collaboration. So from the record-like super light versions to this new one, well, there's been some evolution in a certain way, a bit less radical, but you know, I mean, it's Richard Mille, so obviously still pushing the creative and technical limits. The first thing you see is, of course, this uh, steel uh, mesh pattern looking like uh, the strings on your tennis racket. And it's only uh, one cable that goes back and forth just like on a racket and the tension of this steel cable of only 0.27 millimeter is maintained with two tensioners found at 10 and 4 o'clock. But of course it's not only a design element as parts of the movement are actually attached to it working like some kind of a very original bridge and it allows this watch to withstand even greater g-forces without interfering with the watch's proper running. 12,000 g's to be precise and I guess they had to do this not to get Rafa's watch in after sale service too often. So the case is made out of a new robust but still very light material used in watchmaking called Tita Carb and exclusive to Richamel. It's a polyamide with 38% of injected carbon fibers and that sounds totally Richamel. And the result is that this watch weighs only 30 grams. I mean, 30 grams, that's crazy. So this uh, RM27-04 is of course still a tourbillon and is limited to 50 pieces as usual. And as I'm talking, well, I'm pretty sure they're already uh, all sold out. And yes, uh, we are talking Richard Mille prices, approximately 1 million US dollar, a little bit more. So we rarely talk about prices, but in this case, always fun to mention. I mean, the price is just kind of part of the show and setting the brand in a full league of its own. Bravo, and you are totally unique. So the other timepiece that I quickly wanted to mention is this new RM72-01. And as mentioned, this is their first fully developed in-house flyback chronograph. And its main technical feature is that the running of the chrono is dissociated to the normal timekeeping function of the watch. Therefore, power reserve is not impacted if the chrono is running or not. But personally, I believe that this would require a proper video report by itself. I see what we can do about that. Okay, on the dial side, you have uh, three sub counters, one for the normal running seconds, another one uh, records the chronos minutes, and that's a real 60 minute counter. I like this, and same can be said about the final uh, hour counter with a 24 hour scale. So regarding the Kronos second hand, well, this one is classically found in the center. And finally, and on the design note, I quite like the original display of the hour numbers, 3, 8, 11. Not very usual for sure. Okay, next watch, and we'll uh, tone down the level of super high-end watchmaking with a new Omega who released a special Speedmaster celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Silver Snoopy Award received in 1970 by the NASA astronauts. So you will therefore see a laser engraved Snoopy on the 9 o'clock uh, sub-dial, but the pretty fun part is that when you flip the watch, you will again uh, see Snoopy, but this time aboard his space uh, vehicle, and this one actually moves around when the chrono is in function. So it will disappear behind the dark side of the moon, a nice little wink at the previous and rather successful Speedmaster model. And okay, well, so one may think that yet another anniversary type of model by Omega, but this one has a little fun twist and uh, with the Olympics being pushed back till next year, and now that we just heard that the next James Bond will also be pushed till April of next year, well, they do uh, what they can to come up with some newish model, if I can say so. And final info, I mean, this pretty cool uh, looking speedy is not limited. Okay, and now for some business news. Well, as you can expect, nothing brilliant. The industry is really being hit big time numbers for this year will be really significantly down and naturally some players are being hit much more than others although most of the industry is still benefiting from uh, temporary unemployment measures the Swiss government having extended these periods of support which were supposed to end last month so the situation is such that almost half of the entire Swiss watchmaking workforce is benefiting uh, one way or the other from these uh, measures really crazy time but the first serious and grave announcements of some suppliers going bankrupt or laying off personnel have started and this will inevitably and unfortunately continue and probably accelerate uh, and this is very worrisome. On the brand side, nothing too official and no one really wants to lose face and take decisions that have just been delayed uh, but for how long? And when I say lose phase, what I mean by that is that uh, in a very challenging uh, commercial environment, I mean, no brand really wants to send out a bad message to its customers, whether end customers or retailers. 
So in a way, it may feel like uh, there's a slightly, they are slightly more concerned by communication worries than actually financial ones. And this can only happen thanks to these exceptional government measures supporting the industry. But one group had the courage to face this reality and unfortunately laid off a quarter of its workforce, 100 people, as the CEO of uh, Ulysse Nardin and Girard Pego made these announcements a couple of weeks ago. So definitely not an easy decision, but a rather responsible one. And so far, no news of brands going bankrupt, but yes, there aren't many positive signs out there, apart uh, for the big players, this group of approximately 10 brands that we've already talked about, and for the smaller and more agile independent brands. I'm not saying it's easy for these guys, but I would say that they are in a slightly more envious position than others. So to give you an idea, uh, Audemars Piguet is saying that turnover should be down by 10 to 12% this year, and that's still a very successful brand. So whereas, I mean, if you look on the Richmond and Swatch Group uh, brand, I mean, they are said to be around the minus 40 to 50 percent mark. So that's massive and there will be undoubtedly some severe consequences coming along. We've even heard some quite crazy rumors, but we'll wait on this uh, till more comes out, as well as the Tiffany's buyout saga by LVMH, uh, which is heading in the justice direction as LVMH may, uh, came back slightly on their offer, trying to lower the price of the acquisition because of the current business climate and the uncertainties that goes with it. So lawyers are happy. Okay, another news uh, that won't help either and concerns the UK is that the government is trying to modify how you can buy detached products over there. And we know how much London is a shopping destination for many tourists. Okay, the COVID situation doesn't make travel easy, but nevertheless, this certainly won't help. So basically, you will still be able to get your tax refund, but then the store where you bought your watch will have to send it to you via mail, meaning that you will have to pay your import tax duties upon reception of your timepiece. And uh, well, we know that this will be a serious turnoff for some. But on the other hand, and this is a positive, as it demonstrates uh, the need for retailers and brands to take even more care of your local market, something witnessed a bit everywhere actually. And you can't count on travel retail, I mean that's definitely gone for a little while, so treat well the people around you and connect more with your local base, super important. Okay, still in the business section of this prime time, uh, well, all the selected watches participating in this year's GPHG have been announced and are visible on the GPHG website. And as usual, not too many big brands are participating despite the new academy format of the event with a much larger group of people involved in this selection process. So we don't yet know uh, how the event will actually take place in early November, physical or just digital. And some announcements about this are due in the very days to come and we'll keep you informed. Regarding uh, the situation on watch shows for 2021, well, uh, nothing's still too clear apart that, uh, very sadly, we know that the industry totally missed out on the opportunity of centralizing one big event in one place at the same time. So it really looks like we'll be having some kind of updated Watches and Wonder in Geneva in early April with the addition of some of the big brands that left uh, Baselworld, Rolex, Patek, Chopin and company. But we now know that there will be another event uh, held in Lausanne uh, called Imagination uh, for some of the brands that used to be in Baselworld, but Baselworld is actually hanging in there with another event called Our Universe. Obviously, all this is still really hanging in the air with the evolution of the COVID, and you guys know my opinion about all this, and it just amazes me how the industry can manage to shoot themselves in the foot with an RPG in these particular circumstances. But in the meantime, some are still trying to make things happen elsewhere and hooray to them. For instance, uh, this month in Mexico will be held a CR between the 20 and 22nd of the month in Mexico City. I wish I could go and I know it will be a great event, but the prospect of not knowing how things will evolve, meaning being potentially blocked there, well, all this has made me uh, take the decision of staying wisely, but unfortunately here in Geneva. On the other side of the planet, another event called uh, Watchfest will happen in Sydney, Australia. A mix of physical uh, gathering on the 17th and Zoom sessions over three days between the 14th and the 17th. Well, people are trying their best to make things happen. And again, bravo to them. So we're reaching uh, the end of this prime time. Hope you enjoyed this. Stay positive and stay safe. And remember, time is what you make of it. So all the super best to you. Thanks for watching. Thanks again for your support. Can't wait to have this uh, live session with our patrons soon. And can't wait to share with you the new contents we are currently working on. See you all and more than ever, Viva Watchmaking! Mm -hmm.